Have you booked that trip to Ireland yet? Press the green button and visit the island of Ireland. See Ireland.com. Eurogold is driven by being the best civil engineering contractor in the Northwest, ensuring its clients are given the highest level of service that they deserve. Eurogold work in a wide range of industry sectors, including house building, highways, commercial, and industrial build. La Vita is an award-winning, independently run Italian restaurant. Located on Rose Lane in the heart of Liverpool, real Italian-style dishes, using the best ingredients, skillfully prepared by our chefs. Come and try our serious Italian experience. The Warrington Irish Club friendly and welcoming club keeping the Irish culture alive. We have Irish and country music every Saturday night, tribute nights, race nights, charity nights and karaoke. All live sports are shown on big screens. We have snooker, dominoes and crown green bowling teams along with arts and craft. Pop in for a friendly welcome and book your event at the Warrington Irish Club. Give Frank a call on 01925 243 363. Mulligan's Funeral and Monumental Services are a family-owned funeral service, first established by the late Brian Mulligan in 1996. We provide funeral homes in Gorton, Manchester and Reddish, Stockport, and we pride ourselves on giving a friendly and professional service to all the families who use our service. Contact us on 0161 432 0809. Founded in Kilkenny, Ireland in 1702, but lost on a bet on a horse race in Deauville, France, 1918. Sullivan's was re-established a few years ago by direct descendants of two great Kilkenny brewing families, the Smithicks and the Sullivans. We're about to embark on our own journey across the United Kingdom. But this time, we won't bet the brewery. <laughs> Sullivan's. Brewing is in our blood. Press the green button and visit the island of Ireland. See Ireland.com. Hello to you all and a very warm welcome. This week we'll be telling you a story about Sullivan's Brewing Company whose drinks are becoming very popular here in the UK. We'll also be chatting to Christine Walker from the Yorkshire Rose of Tully and she's got some news to tell us. But first we're off to the Tyneside Iris Centre in Newcastle. It was a very emotional night for John Charlton, who received the Presidential Distinguished Award on behalf of his late father, Jack Charlton. The presentation was made by Adrian O'Neill, the Irish Ambassador from the Embassy in London. This is my first visit uh, to Newcastle. One of the things that we're going to do tonight, and it's a great honour uh, for me to be able to do it, is to present the Presidential Distinguished Service Award uh, for services to the Irish abroad, uh, to the family of the late uh, Jack Charlton. Wow. Um, for those of, yes, we'll give a little boo to us, I think. Ambassador, we saw you there, of course, making a very distinguished presentation to John Charlton. 
Yeah, well, it was a real honour to do so on behalf of the President because the President normally presents these awards in person to the recipients uh, every year in Norris and Uthoran. But on account of COVID this year and so on, the Charlton family weren't able to uh, weren't able to travel. So I was delighted on behalf of the President to do it this evening. I suppose in Jack's home, you know, kind of home place here in Tyneside. Well, absolutely. And of course, Jack Charlton meant so much to us all. He brought us all so much happiness along him, along with the team. No, absolutely. I mean, those, that, that decade that he was in charge of, you know, of Ireland as manager was, I suppose, a, just a kind of a decade of, of joy. We all felt we were on a kind of a, a journey of adventure, um, you know, through you know, the Euro Championships in Germany in 1988 and Italian 90 and USA 94. I mean, so many, so many happy memories and not just happy sporting memories, but I think memories about the kind of the joy it gave to Irish society as a whole and a, a kind of a, a belief in ourselves and a self-confidence that we hadn't had before. And he became an adopted Irishman, didn't he? He loved fishing, he loved a pint of Guinness now and again. He did indeed, yes, and all kinds of, lots of stories about, you know, about basically, you know, when he presented cheques in Irish pubs, they'd never been cashed because publicans would hold on to them and frame them and things like that. So, yeah, no, I mean, and for many, many years afterwards, you know, when he, when he stood down as manager, he still came back to Ireland and got a great reception wherever, wherever he went. And of course, you know, the, the government made him an honorary citizen of Ireland. And there, there I mean, I think there, there are very few people who've had that honour bestowed upon them. Obviously, all you people know of his connections with the North East and his connections with Ireland and all I can say is on the behalf of everybody else. <laughs> John, a very emotional night here for you and of course your family. A special award made there to your uh, dad uh, by the Ambassador of Ireland. Yeah, it was, it was very kind of him to do that and I honestly don't know what happened. It just it's been a build up of probably the last two years, and I was in Ireland at the weekend, and um, I did a late late show, and I was fine. But for some reason tonight, it just all seemed to the emotion just came out. I think when we all watched your father there and the team playing on the screen that they showed here before we just done the interview, I think it brought back so many emotions for us all, so much enjoyment. Well, that's, that's the thing that would have pleased him the most, is that as long, as I said on the stage, as long as the people were happy, which they were, then he was happy. And that's all it was. It was about the enjoyment and it was about just doing the best that you can and as I said tonight, it, it, it's had a big impact on the way that Ireland has progressed in the last 20, 25 years. Yeah. It was really lovely to see his granddaughter here this evening. Yeah, Neve, and uh, she has a sister called Roisin. So I think and that shows the degree to which kind of, you know, Ireland kind of uh, imposed itself on the, on the Charlton family that, you know, that uh, when it came to, you know, the, the naming of, of Jack's uh, grandchildren, they were given Irish names, which is a lovely touch. Now, Neve, what was it like? hearing everybody talk so special about your granddad tonight. Yeah, it's just nice to be able to look back and see everything he's done like throughout his years with everybody. And it was lovely for you to receive a beautiful presentation as well from Sarah Mangan, the Consul of Ireland. Yeah, it was, n it was nice to see all the things that he's done in like a pre pre presentation with like everybody. I think it's just a testament to how much Jack Charlton is still loved in Ireland and still remembered so fondly and we were really honoured to be able to have this opportunity to present the award to John Charlton and of course it's not that long ago since his father passed away um, and uh, I think he said himself he was a little bit surprised himself that he was kind of choked up by it but what I had been saying to him is look you know the Presidential Distinguished Service Award it would ordinarily be presented by President Higgins at Oris and Uchtharon, but it, that wasn't possible because of COVID. But in a way, it was lovely to be able to be presented here with the Irish community, who Jack meant so much to. Uh, so it was kind of even more poignant uh, to have that, to have them involved as well.
you were very close to him and of course you worked very closely with him uh, with the Irish Republican team and you went all over uh, you know when they were playing the games and everything. Yeah, we went everywhere. I mean, obviously, 88, 90 and 94 were very important to him, but not only to him, to the people of Ireland. I mean, they had a party like you wouldn't believe. And we used to sit and talk and we used to go for a drink. The night before a game, we would always go for a drink, me and him. And he'd say, what team do you think I should pick? And I used to tell him and he used to pick his own team. So it made no difference what I said to him. I think he just wanted somebody to bounce his ideas off. And when you look back now, I mean, it, it worked out fantastically for him, it worked out fantastically for the players, and also, but more importantly, it worked out fantastically for the country. There wasn't an awful lot to celebrate back in the, in the late 80s and early 90s, and Jack was really part of that regeneration, rejuvenation, um, and so loved by the Irish that, of course, he definitely became an honorary Irishman. We were so grateful to him, but he... I think you're right. I mean, we took him to our hearts, but he also very much took the Irish to his heart too. Yeah, we get great tribute to Jack Charlton, who of course was a great friend of ours, you know. I, I remember the first time he ever came here and I, in the 1980s, I rang him up and uh, uh, I'd been to the pub, Martin, I have to be tr truthful with you. And, and uh, Jerry Lynch said to me, have you really got his number? I said, yes, I've got his number in my diary. And, he said, well, we'll ring him from my kitchen. And it was about 10 o'clock at night, and I rang, rang Jack, and Jack said, of course, you know what he said, how do you get my number? <laughs> and uh, I said, well, I was going to ask you if you'd come and speak at the Irish Centre a uh, week on Wednesday or something. And he said, I'll be there, but I'll not talk about Newcastle. I'll only talk about Ireland. Then he put the phone down. And I, I didn't know, what, would he turn up or not? And, uh, you know, the, the room was absolutely jammed with people because he was at the height of his fate. And it went half past seven, eight o'clock, half past eight. And he wasn't there. And I, I put journalists on the stage to fill in. And, you know, I didn't know what to do. And then about 20 to nine, it was like the Red Sea parting because he came in at the back of the room when he walked up onto the stage. And I was in the chair and I said, oh, I said, uh, I, I'm very glad to see you. Uh, I was beginning to think you wouldn't turn up. And he, he was very short with me then. He says, I told you I would, didn't I? You know? And I was worried all the night, you know, about how much is his fee? You know, well, of course, Jack had a different way of being generous to you than most people would say. He didn't say, I'm doing it for nothing, or it's my pleasure. He just said, he said, what a stupid question. He says, if I told you, you couldn't afford it. <laughs> I had a good relationship with Jack. I'd done a lot of after dinner stuff with him when he was the main speaker and I was as, as classified as his, his, his assistant or number two. But yeah, I mean, I'd been out in functions with him for many, many times. And when I finished at Newcastle, uh, I was I was playing down at Wolverhampton Wanderers and he said, listen, if you're struggling, just come up and train with us, which I did. I trained with Newcastle and then on Friday I'd go down to Wolves and play down there for a, for a, um, for a week or two. Uh, but yeah, a great man and a great talent. Well, my dad was a big player, as you know, Martin. Yeah. My dad played for Leeds and Aston Villa for a period of 10 years. I was a semi-pro Bohemians and I was working as a manager of a sports shop. And on the, uh, on the Saturday, managing the sports shop. Sunday, I played in a local derby. M Monday morning, my dad says, get up, come Man Manchester, I want to speak to you. I said, do us a favour, Dad, I was out late last night. He said, no, I'm not joking you, man, you know, I want to speak to you down at the Gresham Hotel in Dublin. Went down and spoke to Tommy Dockery and Sir Matt Busby. Tuesday morning, me and my dad flew to Manchester. And on the Tuesday afternoon, I signed a contract uh, for two years at Manchester and I said, what happens to you in four days is spectacular and that's what happened to me. Ambassador, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us tonight. A great pleasure, Martin, and thank you for all the great work that you do in covering really uh, very important events like this evening's. 
It was a special night at the Tyneside Iris Centre and a big thank you to Tony and Vincent and all the staff who made everyone so welcome. Now we're going to take a little break, don't go away and we'll see you very soon. that trip to Ireland yet? <laughs> Press the green button and visit the island of Ireland. See Ireland.com Euro Gold is driven by being the best civil engineering contractor in the Northwest, ensuring its clients are given the highest level of service that they deserve. Euro Gold work in a wide range of industry sectors, including house building, highways, commercial and industrial build. Lola Vita is an award-winning, independently run Italian restaurant. Located on Rose Lane in the heart of Liverpool, Real Italian style dishes, using the best ingredients, skillfully prepared by our chefs. Come and try our serious Italian experience. The Warrington Irish Club, a friendly and welcoming club keeping the Irish culture alive. We have Irish and country music every Saturday night tribute nights, race nights, charity nights and karaoke. All live sports are shown on big screens. We have snooker, dominoes and crown green bowling teams along with arts and craft. Pop in for a friendly welcome and book your event at the Warrington Irish Club. Give Frank a call on 01925 243 363. Mulligan's Funeral and Monumental Services are a family owned funeral service first established by the late Brian Mulligan in 1996. We provide funeral homes in Gorton, Manchester and Reddish, Stockport and we pride ourselves on giving a friendly and professional service to all the families who use our service. Contact us on 0161 432 0809. Founded in Kilkenny, Ireland in 1702 but lost on a bet on a horse race in Deauville, France 1918. Sullivan's was re-established a few years ago by direct descendants of two great Kilkenny brewing families, the Smithicks and the Sullivans. We're about to embark on our own journey across the United Kingdom. But this time, we won't bet the brewery. <laughs> Sullivan's. Brewing is in our blood. Press the green button and visit the island of Ireland. See Ireland.com. Welcome back. Now we're going to tell you a story about Sullivan's Brewing Company based in Kilkenny, whose drinks are taking the UK by storm. Sullivan's was founded in 1702 in our home of Kilkenny, which is you know, the medieval capital of Ireland. And it was, it's been the home of brewing um, in Ireland for 800 years. Um, so because of the limestone base of the, of the bedrock, it lends itself to, you know, to calcium rich water. And it predates both Smithicks and Guinness. Uh, Smithicks 1710, Guinness 1759. So these were the three big breweries in Ireland in the 1800s when Sullivan's was, was in its real heyday. Um, and uh, Sullivan's was, was led obviously by the Sullivan's family and 300 yards up the road was the Sminix Brewery. Daniel O'Connell, the great emancipator in Ireland, his granddaughter, Bessie Sullivan, she joined the family, she, she, she married Richard Sullivan's son and under her stewardship, she was really you know, the, the matriarch of Sullivan's and under her um, stewardship, she, she grew the business to, to, be, to, to the large export-led brewery that it was. So um, you know, we, have, we have documents of um, Sullivan's arriving to Boston Harbour in the, 18, in the 1840s, which were the famine years. 
Um, they were exporting to Australia, across Europe. So it was a, it was a big you know, brewery, one that we um, are, you know, are immensely proud of. Tragically, the business uh, of Sullivan's fell to a young member of the family. He puts an enormous bet on a horse. Um, uh, as the legend has it, he was uh, a, few too many, a few too many ales um, trying to impress a young lady. And lo and behold, the horse doesn't come in. He's pursued for this debt. I mean, it's to the tune of a million pounds of today's money. It's something, something enormous. And uh, within a year, the brewery folds uh, to pay for, for this debt. So my great-grandfather, James Smithick, ends up effectively coming to the rescue. He's CEO of the brewery next door. And most of the staff uh, go across the Smithicks. Most of the actual brewing hardware go across to the Smithicks Brewery. And by 1964, Guinness had, had, had the majority stake. Uh, you know, they, they bought up the shares over a sort of nine-year period. Um, then they took full control, brought Smithicks, and that's really when brewing left our family. By 2012, there was no brewery left anymore because Diageo had taken the Smithwick's brewery out of Kilkenny. Um, so that's really when we set and trained a plan to bring Boom back to Kilkenny. We chose our export market, which was Buffalo and upstate New York and Cleveland, Ohio, because of the strong Irish diaspora. Um, and so we're now in you know, roughly 15 states, uh, so we've, we've grown from there. Um, and, um, and, 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 and it's been great. And, and, We've really waited for COVID to pass before we can come to the UK, um, but now we're, we're very, very excited about the future of our beer here. We have four beers, uh, three core beers. We've just launched a fourth, uh, which I'm very excited about. Um, so we have Initially, our first beer was a red ale. From the sort of second, third sip, you'd get a rich caramel and biscuit flavour in there. It's not too complex, but there's a lot more complexity in it than, than your standard red ale that you'd, that you'd find. Um, we've got a stout, um, which is net by in no means trying to emulate anyone else. It's got a little bit more com ingredients, more complexity going on than uh, than, than you, you'd find in a Guinness. There's a bit more sort of coffee notes in there and a bit, bit of chocolate taste in it. Uh, we have also a golden ale called Irish Gold, which is um, the beer that I often, when I'm talking about our beers, is always the one I speak about last. And do you know what? I don't understand why sometimes, because when I'm drinking it, I think actually this is probably our best. Uh, and then the, the final one is uh, a pale ale, which we've most recently launched. I literally came over in in the van with the pallet of kegs last night uh, on the ferry. Um, pale ale, as I say, is the trend at the moment in, in the UK. So this has been brewed especially for my market and I think it's gonna, it's gonna fly 4.7%. It's not too, not too weak, not too strong. It'll, uh, it, it'll go down a treat. I'm uh, at the moment living in Liverpool. So that's where we decided to, to launch the beer. We're in the Liverpool Irish Centre doing really well in there. Good few pubs around Liverpool. Uh, most recently moved over to Manchester to launch. I'm in uh, Manchester Irish World Heritage Centre, as you can see the beers behind me. We've got two taps in here doing, doing really well, being really well received with the customers. We are soon to be, uh, soon to be nationally available in on-premise and off-premise and online. So contact me on either telephone, email, however, however you need to. And believe me, if you want the beer, I'll get the beer to you. If you tell me you want it in your pub, I'll have it in there, in your pub pouring within two weeks. More often than not, to be honest, one week. We're on a very, very exciting journey. Um, we're chest thumpingly proud about our city of Kilkenny and we fly that flag uh, you know, everywhere we go. And we're starting to see, interestingly, we're starting to see the, the, the tourist element, because we have our visit, our, our, our home is in our tap room in Kilkenny and, and, and all are hugely welcome there. But now we're starting to see, interestingly, lots of you know, our, our, our US friends, our stakeholders and our, our customers and our, uh, you know, from, from the likes of Ohio and, um, and Savannah, Georgia and, and Manhattan and, and upstate New York, uh, come over and actually just, just come over to, to visit. I've met lots of Sullivans in, in the UK, lots of O'Sullivans. Um, in fact, there's more Sullivans in Chicago than anywhere else in the world. So, not that it's something we expected to enjoy when we, when we go overseas, but there are so many Sullivans around. <laughs> so, it's great. Daniel, we wish you the very best of luck with it. 
And now I'm off to try some of these ales yes. and I do a bit <laughs> taste it. So I'll, I'll probably see you tomorrow because it might take me a while to get through them all. Excellent, and, and only positive feedback is welcome, you understand. <laughs> Good health, lads. Cheers. Cheers. I really enjoy tasting Sullivan's drinks and it won't be long until it's in your area. Now we're off to chat to Christian Walker from the Yorkshire Rose of Tralee competition. Now you can have the best laid plans and sometimes something happens and changes everything. That made me love Mary, the rose of Christine, a few weeks ago we were here celebrating, of course, the Yorkshire Rose uh, Selection Night. But since that, a um, few things have changed. Oh yes, they have. Um, Grace McGrory um, had to step down and she couldn't attend Tralee in August because she'd got herself a new job and um, it was work commitment. It came first. Well, these things happen, and of course, look at um, anything can happen when you're in a situation like this. And August is quite a long way away. Uh, but look at Grace was a wonderful girl on the night. But now you've actually got a new rose. But tell me, what's the mechanism, if you like, for selecting um, another rose? Well, we always have a reserve, and Charlotte was our reserve. I am a children and family social worker and I'm based in Leeds City Council. I work in the child protection remit, so I'm a frontline social worker. Um, in my spare time, I'm also a Horsworth Town Councillor. Um, that fills up my evenings, my weekends, afternoons when I'm not at work. Um, and I do loads of things for that, particularly community-based things. And apart from that, I like to read and spend time outdoors um, and get some downtime as well, because it's quite busy a lot of the time. I've been a children and family social worker for about three years now. I did my degree at the University of York, uh, went straight in at the start of the pandemic. So strange times, difficult times was quite challenging, um, but I absolutely love it um, and I get so much from it and it's just great to be able to, to make a positive difference really. I've Irish danced since I was four. Um, admittedly I've not put the shoes on for a few years but I'm like a duck to water you know put them back on it was like I'd never stopped doing it so yeah it's always been a passion of mine and it, we do it in our family as well my brother does it too yeah and we saw you actually with your brother and you both complement each other very well yeah I mean he's actually a, a very high ranking championship Irish dancer and he's been all over and I've always supported him and yeah we make a good pair on the dance floor absolutely what's it like to be a counsellor in this area and representing the people um it's it's interesting again working within the community one of my roles previously was that i chaired the editorial committee so i was able to help produce a magazine and be able to distribute that across horsworth and that told everybody about what was going on within the community um, i also was able to do a speech at the cenotaph on the remembrance sunday which was a little bit nerve-wracking but a really lovely opportunity as well for anybody that wants a holiday, go when the Rose of Tralee is on, go to County Kerry. Yeah. You'll really, really enjoy it. We'll be there to support her and we go every year that it's on. There's 32 centres from all over the world. Um, we have them from New York, Washington, California and of course London and ourselves. I've been doing my research and doing a bit of reading and it just looks jam-packed but super fun and meeting new people, I just can't wait. It's an amazing opportunity. I feel absolutely humbled and proud that I'm able to represent Yorkshire and go to Ireland and have this fabulous experience. Enjoy your holidays over there in uh, Tralee in August time and look, we're all proud of Charlotte now representing here. She'll do a great job. She will do a great job for us all. So it's come on Yorkshire. <laughs> we wish Charlotte the very best of luck over there in Tralee. I'm sure she'll represent Yorkshire with great pride. Well, that brings us to the end of the show for this week. Henry McGlade is back with us next Thursday evening at 7 o'clock with his show from County Mayo and we are here at half past seven with the Irish in the UK. Until then, bye bye. <laughs>